if you're a child of God, the battle actually is not yours. That brings a lot of relief in my life. I don't have to, okay, okay, I got I to do this. I got to pray. I got to, oh, Lord, I, the battle's yours. I, God, it's yours. It's often, he, he wouldn't say during battle, go, go, Moses, you got to do this. What did he say? He said, having done all, stand. You stand and you hold the ground. You stand in commitment and obedience and a love of Christ and you worship. And then Asa's son, actually Jehoshaphat, actually went into battle, if you can believe this, with the worship team. Just stand there, having done all, stand there and hold your ground. That's how we're going to defeat what's going on in our perversion, our nation. You stand and you say, not on my watch. We're going to pray. We're going to fast. It's not my battle. I don't know what's happening, but God does, and we're aligning our hearts with his. Any child of God, the battle is not yours. Where does my help come from? My 401k, my visa, my gun safe is full. Yeah, but your prayer closet is empty. It comes from my strength? No, God's strength. As a child of God, the battle is not yours. In case you're wondering if I'm trying to offend people this morning, I am a little bit. (laughs) Oh, man. Long story short, God delivered the people. He saved them because they called on him. But guess what? Peace and complacency and comfort set in. So sometimes you should thank God for disruptions. Thank God for distractions, disruptions, because peace and comfort and complacency can actually be our downfall if we're not careful. So what happened? Chapter 15. So the king became complacent, and the Spirit of God came upon Azariah, the son of Obed, he was a prophet. The Spirit of God came upon him. We've talked about that before. In the Old Testament, they would, the Spirit of God would come upon a person. Uh, now in the New Testament, as a believer, you have the Holy Spirit in you, but I still believe the Holy Spirit can come mightily upon believers as they're filled with the Spirit of God. That's what we need. And he went out to meet Asa, and he said to him, Hear me, Asa, and all Judah and Benjamin. The Lord is with you while you're with him. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. So complacency had set in. Apathy had set in. He's not trusting on God anymore as much as what we can learn from this. And a prophet gives him a warning. This is one thing I I think our nation desperately needs, to hear that voice crying in the wilderness If I could talk to the big megachurch pastors and I would have one message to these guys, Steve Furnick, Andy Stanley, Joel Steen, I'd say, guys, it's time to be the the, the warning prophet for a season. You need to stop this encouragement garbage because now we need to warn these people. They need to be encouraged. Yes, thank you. Please, encourage, encourage, encourage. But there comes a time where, where like Leonard Ravenhill said, we need more prophets in our pulpits and less puppets. We, that's the only way, the warning of the prophet saying, in your complacency, in your sin, in your, in your debauchery, wake up. You've got to turn to the living God. And that's where I get frustrated. Sometimes I'll hear these guys' sermons, you know, 500, 600, 1,000, a million views. Not one word of sin ever or repentance ever. How are you going to get a nation to fall on their knees and seek almighty God again unless you call out the sin and you call the people back? We're just like Elijah. How long will you waver between two opinions? If God is God, follow him. And the people answered him, not a word. The warning of the prophet So it's interesting, so powerful was God's presence on Judah that Israel began to follow God as well. Now, if you don't quite understand that, the nation of Israel was broken up into two kingdoms. Judah was about half the size. It was in the southern kingdom. And then Israel was called Israel. It was in the northern kingdom. So if you can picture Jerusalem, the the area of Israel, Israel's the top, Judah's the bottom. They saw God moving in Judah And they begin to desire God's presence again. But then the Bible says something very interesting. Nevertheless, the high places were not removed. 
Nevertheless, the high places were not removed. And you'll see that throughout the Old Testament as well. So remember this, you'll have friends and you'll have family who see the goodness of God and they want it, but they're not willing to remove the high places. Here's a concern that I have with a message like this. I know there's people going, oh, that's what I want, that's what I need, but you're not willing to remove the high places. How do I know what they are, Shane? You know what they are. God's been convicting you what they are, and we continue to stay in rebellion and continue to worship at these high places. One biggie that I talk about often is media choices. Uh Uh-oh, pin drop. But is that not true? These high places, these things we look to that, that are enjoy media if it's good and be built up and encouraged by it. We need more of it. But if it becomes, these things begin to draw you back to, away from God and there's high places that are set up from addictions to bondage, we have to pull those down. And then chapter 16, verse seven, I'll be closing here shortly. And at that time, Hananiah the seer came to Asa, king of Judah and said to him, because you have relied on the king of Syria. Boy, this guy Asa, he was starting off good. Now he's had two prophets come and rebuke him. But isn't that, isn't that interesting? We can start off good. And the longer I live, I know you'll agree, it's not as, it's not as important to, f- to start good. Please start good. But the real, the real battle, the real measure of success is finishing well. Do you know the statistics of how many pastors quit the ministry? 1,500, I think, a month. Two out of 10. Two out of 10 make it if they start after 20, at 25. Moral failings, discouragement. How many of us can think of, of moral failings in the church? Southern Baptists are, are going through a huge controversy right now. It's, it's all around finishing well. Finishing well. And so those daily choices that are so important. So he said, because you have relied on the king of Syria and have not relied on the Lord your God. This is so interesting. He relied on God when he defeated the Egyptians or Ethiopians. And now he says, oh, I got it. I'm going to make a treaty with this other king. I'm not going to rely on God anymore. He said, you relied on the king of Syria to make a treaty and not God. Therefore, the armies of the king of Syria have escaped from your hand. Were the Ethiopians not a huge army? Yet because you have have relied on the Lord, he delivered them into your hands. So is there anything this morning you've taken into your own hands that God wants you to give back to him? Now, how do you think King Asa acted and said, you're right? What did he do? Well, it says right here in verse 10, then he became angry with the seer. Seer was what a prophet was before the word prophet. He was angry with the prophet and he put him into prison. And it's a good reminder that bitterness and anger will get you nowhere. Mad at God, men, Father's Day, it gets us nowhere. We need to begin to pull down those high places again in our homes. So my closing thought is this, when you pull something down, something has to be erected. Whenever you remove something, you have to replace it with something else. So praise God, Asa passed down this to his son Jehoshaphat. And I talked about this earlier. Jehoshaphat, King Jehoshaphat, now a great multitude is coming against this king. And what did he say? He said, for we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. Have you ever been there? Come on, let's wake up, church. Let's stop playing church today. You know life is difficult. We've got on our church faces. Oh, no, nothing bad ever happens to me. I'm always positive. I'm always uplifted. I'm, no, no, no. There's sometimes when we say like this, there's a vast army some, that coming against me. I don't know what to do, but where are my eyes? My eyes are on confusion, on trying to manipulate, on trying to fix it myself. No, my eyes are fixed on Christ and Christ alone. That's why I love that song. It's fixed on Christ. And the prophet said, listen, King Jehoshaphat and all who live in Judah and Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says to you. Do not be afraid or discouraged for this vast army, for the battle is not yours but God's. There's your two, there's your two nemesis right there. Fear and discouragement. Fear paralyzes. I don't want to do anything. I can't move. I can't, I can't, and I'm fearful. And discouragement, oh, I might as well just give up. Those two things will come against you and your family every chance they get. 
There's been so many times I just get so discouraged, like, why are we doing what we're doing? Your, your house looks more like hell than heaven, right? The kids aren't getting along. Everything's, what's going on, Lord? That's the time to press in and saying, yes, a vast army's coming against me, but we trust in you and you alone. Our eyes are fixed on you. So what is the battle plan? Well, we've already just been talking about it. It's worship, it's obedience, it's reliance on God and prayer and, and, and bringing back these, these, these aren't new truths, they're old truths that need to be, back, back, be, uh, be brought back in again. That's why I love that song, I don't want to miss one word you speak. Do you truly say that? Let, do you truly say that? Let me wake up this church this morning. Everybody's waiting for lunch or something, but... Every word you speak, God, I need to hear every word you speak because they are life to me. That's where I get my nourishment. That's where I get my strength. That's where I get my motivation. Everything is life to me. I don't want to miss one word you speak in your word and worship and prayer. That's when God speaks to you. You're probably not going to hear much on CNN or Netflix. You're going to hear a bathe in the word of God, living in the word of God, praying and worshiping. God begins to speak. He says, is that the sweet smelling aroma of sacrifice of a life? on the altar according to Romans oh I hear that voice I'm going to honor that 